Welcome to another episode of the JBK Show. We have a huge guest on today. Again, we're sitting down with an Australian journalist, award-winning journalist, sports reporter, Walkie Award winner, radio presenter, currently the host of Ben Fordham Live. Ben Fordham, thank you for joining us. Huge guest. Huge. <laughs> Mate, I'm t- when it comes to... Media. Media personalities, Ben. <laughs> you're right up there. I know you're neck and neck with Kyle and Jackie O at the moment. You had that little feud going. But, mate, thank you for your time. Really uh, where's Kyle it. and Jackie O? Have they been on? Mate, we've reached out to Kyle. Jackie O seems lovely, but Kyle just seems a little bit... You know, oh, too we much can for do us. that. You know, because Kyle's very competitive. He right? is. So bring a new one, will bring mate, you Mate, the moment he sees me here... He'll be coming on. That's the way he works. He should yeah. get this. If he feels like he's going to miss then. out I've on something. I've crossed paths with him a couple of times in the elevator. No time of day. Don't really? Look at me. Though. But it doesn't mean that. He probably doesn't know who we are, but it's more just like, you know, he's got, he's got, he's busy. He's got, he's got What's a host he to, busy? What's he doing? He's going to take phone calls regularly. You know, the MCs you know, every now and then. <laughs> you know? Hanging uh, out with the Ib. Yeah, exactly right. The oh, big mate, I think Kyle's got a pretty easy life. I mean, he's busy now because he's got a baby and a mm. beautiful wife. Did you, go, did you go that, to the big wedding? No, no, I wasn't at the wedding. No, no, no. So you, don't, you don't want the controversy. The is real. Oh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I was actually hosting a, an event in Orange that weekend, but okay. no, no, no. Kyle and I, I would describe our, our relationship as kind of very, we're mates. Competitive. But we don't kind of hang out in each other's pockets every okay. weekend. We're like we, Ma- Magic and Larry Bird. Yeah, we kind of live different lives. Okay. Although his life is becoming more like mine. Like when he started getting ready to have a family, I remember I called him and I said, mate, you're going to love this. And he goes, I think I'm going to hate it. (laughs) It's going to ruin my life. And I said, no, it won't. And I said, look, to get you ready for it, I'll start sending you photos of my kids. He goes, I don't want to see photos of your kids. So I just send him photos of my kids. Randomly. Cute little photos and I'm drawing a picture. And he goes, why are you sending me this stuff? I go, mate, I'm just getting you ready. And look, you look at him now with baby Otto and, you know, he's having the time of his life. Now, mate, a little bit about your backstory. We, we went to some, some Pat Stratford. You went to St. Ignatius Riverview. Yeah. So a bit of a, not a rivalry in rugby, but we, we played each other a couple of times. You would times. have been playing at a different grade than me. Uh, don't I was don't playing yourself the sure. I mean, our school would play maybe your fourth. So yeah, 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 yeah. That's a discrepancy so, of talent. Exactly right. But there's a lot of, I'd say, high-profile people to come out of Riverview. I mean, like yourself in your field. Tony Abbott, ministers. a couple of premiers, a yeah. few Wallabies. Yeah. Did that set you, did that, you know, that education from that school give you your career trajectory almost? Not really. I, I don't think I, I, I wasn't big on school. Like I, I really enjoyed it there and I love the, the mates that I met. In fact, I've you know, still got the mates today that I had when I, when I went to school. Mm-hmm. And we just last week um, buried one of my, my mate's mums, Anne Hayson. And it was you know, one of those moments that you realise I've been out of school 20 years, uh, but you still have those close bonds and you know that you know, when one of the boys is in trouble, like um, Anne died a very early Sunday morning two weeks ago, and by about 11 a.m. I was over at her husband's house, Paul, and I thought, what do you do? And, and they're wogs, so you, I, you go up to Maggio's, which is my local, and I got, okay, I've got, I've got the bread, I've got uh, the pastries, I've got some pizza, and then I thought I'd better get a bottle of tequila as well. So, you know, those kind of friendships that I made. And look, the school's a great school mm. and, and that's probably where my son's going to go as well. But I always said to myself, I'm not going to just send my kid to the school that I went to because that's mm. where I went. But what I got out of it is a general philosophy about looking out for other people because, you know, I, every school's kind of got a motto or something like that. Ours was a man for others. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of something I got out of it. I didn't always practice it when I was at school, but I met people who was so amazing. Like I met a guy at school called Daniel Street who set up his own charity when he was like 19, 20, along with some other blokes as well. Wow. And I thought I've never done charity work apart from stuff that I had to do at school. So some of that stuff rubs off on you, you know, mm. where you kind of think, all right, well, I, I, I want to get involved in some of that too. And, and I have later in life. Uh, but look, it was a great place, but I, it didn't define me. Sure. You know, you come across people and it's like, they only talk about either where they live or where they went to school or their job or whatever. I've never felt that I was kind of really defined by where I went to school. And I didn't stand out at school too much. You so didn't peak in high school? No. Yeah. I wasn't a top sports person. I was certainly not a top academic mm. kind of performer. Well, you, you did do an internship fairly young with Alan Jones and that's what made you yeah, fall yeah, in yeah. love with, with broadcasting? I, I wanted to work. I've never been to university and I probably never will. 
In fact, I think I can safely say I'll never go to university. You're not going to do your masters. No, mate. I, you know, my wife's studying law at the moment, so Jeez. she'll be able to defend you boys one day. Yeah, we need that. Um, but <laughs> I just decided I want to work. You know, so we didn't have work experience at school, so I set up my own. I said I'm going to go and do work experience. So I went and did a week of work experience on the Alan Jones Breakfast Show wow, at certain. 15, and I now host that show. It's not Jeez. called the Alan Jones Breakfast Show anymore. <laughs> But it's, it's weird. But when you see that in people, when you see people who are so keen and they mm. want to do it, like I've had a work experience girl, Lucy Borg, who's 15. She came into us about a year or so ago. She's probably 16 or something now. And she was so hungry. And she was really good at being able to talk to people. And you know when you notice that in people, and I said to her, hey, where does this come from? Where's your confidence come from? And she goes, what do you mean? I go, well, you know, being able to talk to people on the phone and everything at 15, mm. she goes, Oh, I work on Macca's drive through <laughs> That's experience. She yeah. goes, you try doing Macca's drive through 11 o'clock on a Friday night and you'll quickly learn yeah. how to talk you to all to sorts characters. of people. So That's when mayhem. I spot those people, now Lucy's now doing year 12, but when she finishes next mm. year, and I'm sure she's watching right now, hey Lucy. Best of luck in the exams, Lucy. Yeah, we'll be saying, Lucy, come on in. So I'm always yeah. looking for people. What, so McDonald's? That's, a, that's a probably big No, yeah, I won't name no, McDonald's. McDonald's. Don't. It's like <laughs> Ember at 11 p.m. Yeah, it's <laughs> different it's pretty to Warunga. But in saying that, what, you know, in your personal experience, when did you figure out that you had that, you know, knack for talking to people and being a media presenter? Yeah, my dad taught me when I used to come home with report cards that weren't too flash and you'd have that initial moment of, oh, mate, not too good. Mm. Dad would then say to me, listen, I'll just tell you something. If you know how to talk to people and you know how to write, you'll always have a job. If you can talk and if you can write, you'll always have a job. And he goes, when I say write, he goes, that doesn't mean you know how to write a book. If you know how to write a letter or an email and you know how to communicate with people, you'll always be sweet. So it's funny with my kids now, mm. they'll say to me, oh, we'll be at the cafe and they go, oh, can we get a gingerbread man? I go, yeah, go and ask for it. And they go, no, can you? You know, like this is at three or four. I go, no. If you want it, you go and ask for it. You're building because it just tr teaches people. And mm. we're up at Avoca on the Central Coast over Christmas time, and the kids, I just bought them an ice cream, right? So they just had an ice cream, and then they go, oh, can we get some hot chips? So I go, no, you just had an ice cream. But then my daughter, Pearl, is looking at these two old ladies eating hot chips, and she goes, they've got some. And I go, go and ask them for some. You know, I was just throwing it out there. So as we left, I thought, oh, no, she's doing it. She walked over to two old ladies, having their lunch, eating their own hot chips, and I couldn't hear the conversation. <laughs> but I just saw these ladies smile and look over and they went, sure, and they gave her hot chips. And my son, Freddie, goes, how come she got some? And I go, because she asked. If you want something and if you don't ask for it, mm. there is no chance in the world you're going to get it. So I think I've always just been brought up to mm. speak, ask, put your hand up, have a go. And the worst thing that could happen is it doesn't work out for you. So you're just preparing for your kids for life in media. Yeah, or life in anything. Yeah. You know, I just love that. When you come across kids who've got confidence, anyone who's got it, and you guys have got bucket loads of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't help but be impressed by it or you get swept up in that, that energy, you know, mm. so. Well, you, you, saying that, like, your family uh, were big rugby league, rugby union fans initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how I think you got, got started in that life of sports. We saw you last year at the Origin, little cameo Yeah, you there. guys in the front row. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was doing some bits and pieces yeah. on the sideline. Were you always, you know, a, a rugby league family or a rugby union family? We were a rugby union family um, because my dad, his passion was rugby union and wine, essentially, apart from his job. Mm -hmm. And then he managed the Australian under-21s and Ricky Stewart was in the Australian under-21s rugby union. Rugby union team. And then one day, Ricky got a phone call from the Canberra Raiders and he was offered money to come and play rugby league. He spoke to his dad, Les. And Les said, mate, who was that guy who was the manager of your under-21s team? And he goes, John Fordham. He goes, ring him. He seemed like he was pretty switched on. So Dad said to Ricky, look, I'll help you with it. He goes, but um, I'll just do it for you as, as mates, right? And That's he said, awesome. no, no, I'll pay you. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm just doing it as mates. So the first meeting for Ricky to join the Canberra Raiders was in our dining room <laughs> at home. And we hid upstairs, me and my brother and my sister, and we had these stairs where there was like gaps between the stairs. <laughs> so we could kind of certainly hear it. And we were listening in, they made Ricky an offer. And I remember my dad saying to the chief executive of the Raiders at the time said, mate, 
I've got a beautiful bottle of red wine here. Let's not spoil it. Let's just enjoy the wine. And the guy goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, what you've just offered, there's no way in the world. <laughs> now, mind you, Ricky would have done it for a bag of chips, mm. right? He was earning nothing in rugby union. But that pr probably rubbed off on me as well, learning about negotiating and things like that. And, mm. and then eventually he said, oh, let me go and make another phone call. And then they eventually got there. And Ricky became a professional rugby league player. We then really followed Ricky to ru rugby league. Um, and then I became this, you know, disloyal rugby league fan because when, when Ricky would switch clubs, I would as well. Like at one stage, you know, he's at the Roosters, then he was at Parramatta. Sharks. And Especially was, as yeah, a coach. The Sharks. Yeah. He's back to Canberra. Yeah, he's back Canberra. to Canberra, you know, and I, I love Ricky. I, I know he um, rubs people the wrong way because he's passionate, gets angry from time mm. to time. Um, but yeah, it was that introduction through my mum and dad. Mum and dad have got their own business. Dad yep. died a few years ago, but my brother now runs the business. And it's a management business? It's a management business. And that these days, and that really, I say to Ricky, without that call to my dad, their whole business wouldn't have started. Wow. They were doing public relations, like looking after hotels and cruise liners and airlines. And then Ricky's thing opened up this whole thing of people, managing people. And back then, people didn't have managers like they do now. Mm. Now every player's got a manager. But Ricky was just smart enough to know, hey, I'm not going to be able to negotiate the best deal. Let's bring in a professional. When you need a lawyer, you get an expert. Mm, yeah, right? When you need an accountant, yeah. you get an expert. So if, you, if you're getting a a deal and someone's there and you're trying to negotiate the best deal, you get a pro to do it. And so that really kicked it off. And now my brother's really taken the business into a whole other area where he's now creating his own content, TV shows, building businesses. Nick was involved in building up the Manshake. You remember when Manshake came along with Adam mm. McDougall and- Former Newcastle great. Yeah, and it was sold last year for a whole ton of money and yeah, right. Adam did really well out of it and my brother did well out of it, so-, so Your family um, master negotiators, who else do they, they represent? Obviously represent yourself as well. Oh yeah, yeah, they look after, I do, I, it's funny, I've always done my own negotiations with my own bosses because I think it looks a bit weird if you get someone else to Sending talk to your mum or dad or your brother in to, to talk to fair, the boss. I, get, I throw Nick in. I go, Nick, you go, you tell him. Well, he's better looking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so he's going to get more. He's but, a bit more hard ass. But as yeah, well. other things outside, I get them to do it. But when it comes to me negotiating my salary with my boss, I've always done it myself. And the reason is, is because I think it's good FaceTime and good, you know, mm. um, relationship building between me and them. And I reckon it's harder for them to say no to me. Because equally it, as you saying no to them is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I reckon it's it's. I reckon when they're looking you in the eyes, and and you're saying, "Come on, you know how much I've put into this. You know how hard I work. You know how good I am for we for you. I never say no to you." I I reckon it's harder for them to to jam me. So I've always done that part myself. But yeah, they look after a whole range of people from um, you know people involved in rugby league, coaches like Ricky Stewart. They still look after Ricky. Yeah, wow. Well. You know, and it's funny like that arrangement that my dad had with Ricky Stewart of no charge, that went on for all through Ricky's playing days. It was only then I think when he, he moved clubs that Ricky then said to dad, you're going to have to start accepting a fee for what you do for me. Dad said, mate, if that's the case, no deal. You know, we're mates. And Ricky said, all right, well, you know, typical Ricky fashion, like ripping a door off. He said, um, all right, well, it's all over then. <laughs> Yeah, Dad's the OG Jerry yeah, Maguire. Yeah, so he said, <laughs> so Dad then said, so eventually they then said, all right, Dad, he, Ricky said, I feel uncomfortable about it. You do all this stuff for me. If you don't start accepting something, um, then we're just going to have to be mates and I'm going to get a proper, get another manager that I'm going to be paying. So, um, you know, they've got, you know, Ricky's family, Ricky's kids and Ricky and Kaylee's kids are now mates with us. And it's mm. funny where you're like, I now hang out with Ricky's kids and it's just bizarre. I lived with Ricky at one stage. I was a political correspondent. I was sent to Canberra and I called Ricky and said, where should I live? Give me some suburbs in Canberra. Mm. I was 20. He goes, live with me. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm not living with you. Just give me some suburb names, you know. I'll move into a share house or a rental. And, and he goes, no, 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 move in with me and then we'll find something for you. So I moved in there. Steve Walters had just moved out and I moved in. Kevin Walters' brother? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and he was the hooker in, in the green machine. And um, then I discovered Ricky had a pool table and he just didn't have anyone to play pool with. So <laughs> He was bought up in Yeah, Canberra. and he was really good at it. And um, so I was like, mate, you just love beating people in pool and you don't have anyone to play. So, you know, that loyalty, like what my parents did for Ricky, it's funny, mm -hmm. he was then repaying that loyalty with me, moving with me. And um, eventually um, we moved around the corner. Brad Clyde 
uh, from the Green Machine. He lived next door. He had the world's big, biggest VHS collection. You're too young for VHS. <laughs> no, 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 we, no, no, we, we grew up on it. But, you know, Ricky used to say to me, he goes, mate, Clyde's VHS collection is going to be worth a fortune one day. <laughs> and then DVDs came along and streaming and... I don't know what Clyde's doing with Tell his Tell him to hold on VHS. to him. You never hold know. He's collector You're going to come back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything comes back. Look at records 50 to 100 years now. You never know what's going to happen. You, so you were a political correspondent. You've had a, a number of roles in media. You started off, you know, with Nine the Current Affair, yep. um, 60 Minutes, moved over to the Today Show. Now you're at 2GB. You've been hosted Ninja Warrior. What's been your favourite role in media? Radio by a million miles. Like, radio, TV's a lot of fun, mm. but it's slower, whereas... Radio, it's like radio is the roller coaster, and TV is sometimes the Ferris wheel. You know, it's just it just takes longer to do things. Is TV a lot more scripted? Yes and no, as much as you want it to be. But I'll just mm. give you an example. If there's something happening right now, and I'm like, okay, I found out about this. We want to break this story. We want to get someone on. I can text someone, and I go, I need you to come on now and and talk about it. And they're on 30 seconds later. TV not so easy, you know, because yeah. they go, the boss will go, well, mate, hang on, we've already got commitments this morning. I go, but this is big. We need to be doing this now. All right, what time are we doing it? You've got to consult a lot more, you know. And also, we need to get a camera to them. During COVID, it kind of, that all broke up a little bit and, and everyone became acceptable with, all get right. someone over yeah, Zoom. Yeah, we can do it on Zoom. We can mm. do it on the phone. We can do whatever. But radio, the great thing about it too is it's my show. I've got a great team of people to do it with me and there's a lot of collaboration that goes into it. But ultimately I can say, that's what we're doing today. Whereas on a TV show when you've got a co-host and you've got an executive producer and different people you've got to deal with, you know, naturally you don't make all the calls, you know, as much as Carl Stefanovic would like to think that he's the boss of the Today Show. There's another guy who's the boss of the Today Show. Yeah, that's but right. I had a lot of fun. I was on there for four years and it was Carl, Lisa, Georgie Gardner, Richard Wilkins, and, you know, like amazing people. We got to travel the world, going to mm. the royal weddings and going to New York. We used to take the show on the road and go to New York and you'd be sitting on the, on the plane, you know, and you, because you're, you're working so hard and you don't have a lot of time to, to kind of kick back, all of a sudden you're sitting in the plane and drinking as much as you want to have and, you know, it was a lot of fun. And, and I still do bits and pieces for, for Nine, but the day-to-day, -day, I don't know what it is about radio. I, I feel like it's like you don't have a harness. Like you just... A lot more free. Yeah, and sometimes you just feel like... Mm. Sometimes I think to myself while I'm talking on radio, I don't know what I'm saying next. Well, you just don't. Because you sometimes you... I'm doing a court story and I need to be clear about are they pleaded guilty, not guilty. Facts. You know, you mm. have those basic things that you're, you're working off. But then there's another half of the show that's just based on, I don't know what someone's going to say, what's going to happen while what, you're on. What a caller might say. Yeah, and sometimes Pete, things happen where... Like, do you remember Melissa Caddick, the fraudster from the eastern suburbs? She was the lady who, she disappeared. She took all this money off people and then she disappeared. Mm. And then for months everyone was like, where's this Sydney mum? She's gone missing. And, you know, she killed herself. Has she been killed? Has she run off overseas? And, and I remember on the morning I'd been filming Ninja Warrior the night before. So I'd worked from 5 p.m. through to 3 a.m., and then gone straight in to do the radio show, 5.30 till 9. That's good. So just Red Bull. And then um, I had someone contact me and said, I think something big's about to break. And then I was talking to them and, and then I discovered they found something. And it turns out they found her foot down oh, the geez. south coast, which was confirmation that she was dead. Mm. You know, like things like that, you just don't know. Mm. You don't know like... And it's the way you respond to it. You know, yeah. someone dies. And you're on what? No, big no sleep. That's what you I know, mean. I'll give you one other quick one. You know, Cleo Smith, there was that girl from Western Australia, the little girl, she went missing for like mm. 18 days. She was grabbed out of a tent in Western Australia. Yeah, I do remember that. And it, that was on the other side of the country. But if a kid's gone missing, I'm, I'm going to be on it every day. Mm. It's day 10, day 11. I was like, you know, because you think, oh, my God, where's this girl? And then I was on air one morning and my executive producer walked in a piece of paper and just handed it to me and I read it and it said statement about Cleo Smith from West Australian Police. So I wrapped up whoever I was talking to and I said, now I've just been handed a piece of paper. And I started reading it. I hadn't read it, 
So this is one of those examples of no harness, you're just live. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know where the statement's going. So is it's it a blind reaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it about to, and it was quite lengthy, so I'm reading it. And then it got to the part where they said, we received a tip off to go to a house in Carnarvon. Officers broke through the back door. They went into a room. There was a little girl in the room on her own. The officers asked her her name. She didn't answer. They asked again, what's your name? And she said, my name is Cleo. And I just started bawling my eyes out on radio because I'm like, oh my God, she's alive. Yeah, wow. Well. And then I, for the next five minutes or so, I just spoke from the heart about the reaction to this situation. I mean, my God, this girl, they thought she was gone. 18 days, 18 nights, and then she's found alive. And those words, my name is Cleo, just broke me. And then eventually I took a break and I composed myself and I was like, righto, and now we go into rolling coverage of this thing. And in the break, I'm texting coppers I know and trying to find out the police commissioner's phone number from Western Australia and whatever. And then I composed myself. I came out of the break and I went, right, I'm okay now. Because I was bawling my eyes out. Yeah. Came out of the break and I was like, okay. And then I went again. Because <laughs> I was like, and people say it happens when you become a parent. I don't know whether that's the case or sometimes. Because there'll be other cases where I'm fine. Mm. But for some reason, I've kind of ridden the... Maybe you're so invested in this. The journey story, on yeah. it. And then um, and then I still remember that video of the of them getting her out of there and she said, my name is Cleo. And it was just like, you know, those moments like that, they don't happen every day. Mm. But when they do and when you're live on the air, they're, they're fantastic. Well, it, it, on radio, it's, it's fairly fast paced. Like, what's your what's your schedule like day to day? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you must be used to getting up pretty early. Yeah, wake up at three. Do the Mark Wahlberg, 2 a.m., work out, <laughs> three o'clock, family time. 100%, between yeah, no, no, no. My wife and I both wake up at three. Um, Jody reads the 5 a.m. news on Channel 7, and I do 2GB breakfast. So she's on air at five, I'm on air at 5.30. And we've got a lady called Pam who turns 80 today. She comes into our house at three o'clock in the morning. I met her in Bunnings, of all places. No joke, about five years ago, I was in Bunnings and this lady walks up to me and she goes, oh, this must be Freddie and Pearl, my kids. And I'm like, yeah, hi. She goes, how are you, darling? And she's kind of like that lady that, you're like if you're on holidays down the coast somewhere, she's the lady who lives next door, just a real mm. lovely knockabout kind of lady. And for some reason, I spoke to her for about 10 minutes and I got a really good vibe from her. And I said, look, this is going to sound a bit weird, but can I get your number? She goes, yeah, sure. So I said, you were hitting on her. Right? Yeah, I'm hitting on her. <laughs> she was about 75 at the time. She was. Yeah. And I kept her number. And then when I found out I was doing the breakfast show, Jody says, well, how does that affect me? Like, because I'm in a Channel 7 in the morning. Hmm. What am I expected to quit my job? I was like, no way in the world. I said, we'll just find someone to come in. She goes, at three o'clock in the morning. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll find someone. And I was like, so I went outside and I just put Bunnings into my phone. It came up Bunnings Pam. I call her, I go, you remember me? She goes, yeah. I said, look, it's probably not one for you because I'm like, you know, 75. She's not going to, you That's know. her usual sleep schedule. Yeah, <laughs> that's what she said. She goes, I'm up at four o'clock anyway. What's the problem getting up at three? So her and her daughter, Dominique, they job share it. They come into the house, you know, at three o'clock in the morning. Jody and I both go to work. That's awesome. And then you just kind of make it work, you know. Mm. Jody's now studying law, so it's like, okay, that's another thing as well. Um, but it's amazing as human beings, you just have a way of, Coping, you know, when you hear those stories, the other stories I love are survival stories. Mm. You know, I'm up for a missing kid. There's a missing kid. I'm always covering it. And if there's a survival story, it's like when my team are pitching stories in the morning, they go and they know, they go, mate, someone survived for six days lost in the bush of Queensland or the Northern Territory and they survived just off, off eating worms. And I'm like, survival story. I love them. <laughs> and you learn through those things. Gets that, ratings. Oh, well, it's just that I love them. <laughs> yeah, you enjoy them. Same as I love movies. If there's mm. a movie involving like a castaway or something like that, I just love that idea of people managing to get by. You must have been a big fan of Lost TV shows. Yeah, yeah, Lost, yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. But I, you learn through those things that people just have a habit of coping, you know. Mm. And like, mate, at the end of the day, I am hosting a bloody radio show. I'm not out there on the streets working as a copper or a firefighter. Mm. But when you, when you, told this is what you got, this is what you got to do, you just do it. How do you go about getting guests on the show? You mentioned before with that Cleo story, you were trying to ring the Western yep. Australian Chief of Police. Yep. Do you reach out to people personally and say, yeah, can yeah. you come I, on I, this time? I text them. I'm big on text and I say to my guys, like, email's dead. 
if I, I, I kind of teach everything that I know to the um, team that work with me. And if they ever say, oh, yeah, we've emailed them, I go, mate, email is dead. Don't email people. Like, you know, you'll know when we were interacting to line mm. this up. It's like everything for me is on text. Yeah. Um, our team operates on WhatsApp. And usually what will happen, for example, this morning after the show, we went, let's get Tanya Plibersek on uh, at some stage in the next week or so. Um, and so what we'll do is I'll text Tanya and I'll say, hey, just so you know, our office is reaching out to your office to line this up. But just to reinforce it, you send the text as well because otherwise they can just kind of brush you off. Yeah, takes two to Whereas with a, the great thing about a text message is it's like, well, we all know. We're all on our phones. We've got, you've got the message yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've either responded or you don't. <laughs> and sometimes true. people will, will brush you if they don't want to talk. Other times people will come on. Like I had the police commissioner on recently in New South Wales because police tasered a 95-year-old grandmother Oof. in a nursing home. And um, What could she have been doing? Oh, mate. Well, she had a knife. She had dementia, right? But she's 95, 47 kilograms. Just maybe get a hold of her. You know, you I mean, know. mate, you could have thrown a blanket over her. <laughs> right? You could have shot her with a water pistol. Yeah. But someone tasered her. And so I remember on that one, I said to Karen Webb, the police commissioner, I texted her and said, you need to be on the front foot on this. You can't be seen to be hiding. I'll mm. talk to you at 7.45 tomorrow morning. So I find as well, instead of saying, can you please come on at 7.45 tomorrow? It's in your best interest. Yeah, I just say, you need to be on the front foot. Yeah. I've got 7.45 free for you in the morning. We'll talk then. And they can still say no, mm. but I, I reckon you're better off just saying, we'll yeah, talk tomorrow You're already tomorrow half morning. answered the question. Yeah, yeah we're always yeah. Half, we're halfway there. Your job in a way is, you know, as much as it's reporting, you're giving out opinions, you, you, you speak to a, a fairly large audience of this country. Have you ever thought about making the transition into politics? I've thought about it. When I was about 12 years old, <laughs> I wanted to be the Prime Minister. And I told my mum, who we called the big kahuna. She makes, makes, the, big makes the big decisions mm. in the Fordham family, still does, even though I'm 46. And um, I said to mum, I'm thinking about going to politics. She goes, why? And I said, I think I'd like to be the Prime Minister. And she said, please don't. <laughs> Please don't. And I said, I thought you'd be really proud. You know? Isn't that she the goes, Australian dream? Anyone yeah, can do it? Mum just said, please. She goes, politics is just such a mess. And she was way ahead of her time. You know, now I look at that advice and go, it was good advice. And she mm. goes, you can achieve so much more outside of politics than you can inside of politics. It's nasty. They call each other names. It's so... The scrutiny and, you put yourself yeah, under. Yeah, and, so, and also that too. It's like, you know, like the idea, I can go out and have a good time. And if I make a goose of myself, no one really cares, mm. you know. But if you're a politician and you do it and someone's got a camera there or whatever, all of a sudden it's a scandal, you know. I try and steer clear of personal dramas in yeah. covering politics. If someone's done something, if no one's been hurt and they've had a good time, they've played up, whatever, I don't cover it. Yeah, I feel like it's your job as well. You keep politicians accountable as well. I'm, during the year when they had the New South Wales election, I remember you had... Dom Perrottet on, and you weren't stepping back on grilling him about why there were still mandates, you know what I mean, yeah, like yeah, in, yeah. in some public sectors. Is it hard managing relationships with some people where you do also have to keep them accountable? Oh, mate, I've learned over time how to deal with that as well. The, the professionals understand you're doing your job. So they understand. Sometimes people don't get that. If they haven't been in the, in the business too long, they kind of think, hang on, I thought we were friendly. It's like, yeah, yeah, but I've got a job to do. This you're is not my grilling job. them at dinner. No, no. And mm. it's like, well, like Gladys Berejiklian um, is someone I've got a lot of time for. Auntie right? Gladys. Yeah, yeah, Auntie Gladys, right? Mm. I mean, you guys made her famous, right? Yeah, with she, the, was, she was giving us the numbers. With the COVID yeah. case numbers. She <laughs> yeah. was leaking them to you. Yeah. I want to know about that as well in a minute. But, you know, Gladys is a classic one because when the personal life st stuff came out about Gladys Berejiklian, you know, she was hooked up with Daryl Maguire and she mm. was before the ICAC. I defended her on that because... I didn't believe she'd done anything wrong. Let the girls play. Yeah, well, she was like, what was it, a hot yeah. girl summer, right? Gladys <laughs> was having a good time. I actually made a video about that at the time and used the, your your show. Okay. And like, I was interviewing her. And Green you, you, were, you were on. pretty, pretty, you were grilling her pretty yeah, hard yeah, on that. But, but, but then when we had to wear masks outdoors, I was feraling her. Mm. Because I was like, this is bullshit. I, I, I can't believe yeah. we've got to a point where we're wearing masks outdoors and I pushed back against lockdowns. I pushed back yeah. against vaccine mandates. 
Um, I got vaccinated, um, but we were told at the time it was going to be a choice and then it turned into this thing. And the idea that now you've still got people now, and this is one of the crazy things that I used to raise with Dom Perrottet. He was always actually pretty keen to lift mandates. Mm. But you discover as well in politics... He's got no power. You think that you're running the state and then you find out that you're not and that other people get to decide these things. And I used to say to Dom, how crazy is it that firefighters can't go into their own fire station if they're unvaccinated, but if the dunny breaks and a plumber has to come in, the plumber doesn't have to be vaccinated. <laughs> if the vending machine runs out of chips, the vending machine operator can come in. He doesn't have to be vaccinated, but the firefighter has to be vaccinated to go into the fire Where, station. Where's the science in that too? And mate, if my house is burning and the firefighter turns up, am I checking his vaccine passport? <laughs> there was the same issue with volunteers for, you know, relief for... Charities, everything. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like, it just became, I mean, it just got so crazy and... I, I want to know. The numbers? How did you get the numbers? If I'm being completely honest with you, we, we spoke about our schooling earlier, Ben. You went to review, went to some bats. Four unit maths between us, it was all mathematics. Bullshit. Have you ever heard of pure maths? Yeah. We did it. No, look, honestly, Ben, we, we didn't know anyone directly in New South Wales Health. They did try and uh, sprinkle out a few different numbers. We were, we were getting it. But just from, from multiple people. Yeah. It wasn't just, everyone, just the I'm one. Sure, I'm sure you knew it before. Yeah, you knew it yeah, before. Not the, sure. everyone, not the numbers. Everyone, I think about maybe most people knew it before 9pm. We were just the ones reporting it. Yeah, getting it out of yeah, the Yeah, oh, but you know, when, when you were hitting them right on the number, mm. that's when it was becoming scary. And that's when we started talking about you on radio. Okay, yeah. You know, like it was like, how are they doing and how's it happening? And then you guys just played it up even more. Yeah, <laughs> it was, we made a bit of but, a show. You know, and then all, all of a sudden it stopped. Yeah. So that's where they must have worked out. Well, they were throwing out some dummy they, numbers. They threw yeah. out about five, six different numbers that day. They, they were trying to divert. And yeah. then uh, right after that, we caught a little bit of backlash because we went to the first lockdown protest uh, in the CBD. And, you know, we kind of went through the courts and all of that. And it was, uh, it was a testing time. Like, like I said, the last three years, everyone kind of didn't know what was going on, what you were being told to do. A lot of those fines and that got pulled out. But like you said, you were one of the first people on air, in media, to condemn, you know, lockdowns or ask them, okay, this is getting to a point of it's, they're not needed anymore, where yeah. other people in the media were saying that we need more and more strict lockdowns. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of the times I, I re remember during that time is, do you remember every se second day they'd come up with new rules? Yeah. So there'd be all these new rules. Okay, we've got some new rules today. New rules about everything. Oh, mate. And it got to the point where I remember one day, I said to Gladys, you've got to come in the studio and you've got to explain these new rules because I'm supposed to be an expert on this shit. I don't know what's going on. So she goes, oh, and anyway, she pulled out. She said, I've got something else I've got to do. I can't do it. Mm. So I was like, what are we going to do? I, like, we've got this whole segment where Gladys was going to be answering the questions. And I went, well, let's us answer them ourselves, right, based on all the rules that they've given to us. So I said, ring in. And I got one of my producers at the time, Zach McLean, where I went, you spend the day studying up so you become like the oracle on the rules. So people would ring in, they go, so I, I'm going to my I uncle's place. I I'm this. going to my uncle's place. Um, he lives up the coast, you know, at Port Macquarie. And I go, okay, where do you live? I live in Sydney. All right. And I go, Zach, and we'd play the kind of mm. thinking music. And Zach goes, what, what reasons are you going for? <laughs> he goes, I just want to catch up with him. And then I'd go, is he, is he struggling at all at the moment? He goes, yeah. Oh, I go, well, Zach, that'd be compassionate grounds, wouldn't it? Right? <laughs> and then we'd play, we had the ding, right? I go, Terry, you're all good. You're off to Port Stephens. Anyway, the government's listening to this going, stop it. Mm. And I was like, no, you didn't want to come and answer the questions. And then the moment I remember, I had a mate working for the coppers at the time and someone called in and went, look, you know, remember you could exercise, but you couldn't just go to the beach. You couldn't just go to the beach and You couldn't sunbake. sit there by yourself no. with no one so around So someone you. said... Can my kids go and build sandcastles at the beach? And I went, well, let me think about that. I mean, building sandcastles is exercise, mm. right? Some you're, sort of labour involved. Um, and you're supervising the children. I said, yeah, I think you... And then I remember this mate of mine, this copper, who texted me and went, sandcastles, seriously, mate, stop it. I was like, no, well, you've, you've created 8,000 rules. Yeah. We've got to apparently follow them. So we've got to do our best. That's and, mate, I just got to the point of going, you know, I, my way around the rules was um, if you're exercising, you didn't have to wear a mask outdoors. So I'd always be on my bike. 
I'd just be riding everywhere around our, our neighbourhood. Or going for a brisk walk and getting the calories down. Getting yeah, the that's, steps that's up. the thing. You know what I mean? Didn't have the mask exam. But yeah, do you, do, you, do you ever worry about the, the public backlash to, to something like that, especially when it's something being so pushed by the government? No, home? if I was hurting someone, you know, I, I had a boss who once said to me, he goes, if you hurt someone, uh, people will be pretty ruthless in the way that they will review your behaviour. Mm. If you're not hurting someone, um, and yeah, I suppose you've got to, if I was there, and you never be a hypocrite. So the one thing you never be is a hypocrite. Like the, uh, the old British Prime Minister. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. if you're telling everyone. Party. Yeah, and then he's yeah. doing, Boris is doing Partygate. And it's the same as if, if there's audio of you somewhere telling people not to do something and you're doing it, you're screwed. Which is what happened a lot. Through yeah, those, so what yeah. I've always done is don't ever lecture people about things that I know that I'd be doing. Mm. You know, it's a pretty simple premise, but the idea is don't take the moral high ground on things that you've been guilty of yourself. Um, if there are things that are clearly unacceptable and you'd never do that yourself, then hammer them all you want. Mm. But if it's something where you think, you know, well, you know, there was a, a story recently about uh, Dominic Perrottet when he was Premier, or it might have been, yeah, just as he was wrapping up, his wife was really sick at home and he spoke to Brad Hazard, the health minister at the time about it, and Brad organised an ambulance. And it was a bit of a mini scandal where they're like, oh, you know, he should have called triple zero like everyone else. And then when my team said, oh, we're going to cover that on air, I was like, no. And the reason was is because I was in a situation once where I was with someone at a party having a drink mm. and all of a sudden he goes, I've got to go, I've got to go. He's like, 93-year-old mum had collapsed at home. So then he bolted and he left. And I called him about an hour later and I said, what's going on? He goes, mate, it's, it's, we're still waiting for the ambulance. Ooh. And he goes, and she's getting, she's hyperventilating and, mate, I'm worried. And I was like, okay, so I made a phone call. Pull some strings. And I just said, look, I'm not asking, don't put, the, don't put it in front of anyone else, but I'm just letting you know this guy's not a, a drama queen and he reckons she's in trouble, so I'm just letting... So I was like, well, I'm not going to go now. Mm. So I think that's a basic rule. Don't that's be fair. a hypocrite. No, no one likes a hypocrite. Yeah, for sure. But I, for, for news during that time, like especially that three-year period of COVID, like you said, they were making absurd rules. People were breaking those rules like in politics. Yeah. Do you think people's now distrust of the government and media is at its highest? Yeah, I think so. Because of that point? I think so. I mean, I think it always has been. Australians have always been rebels. Mm. So we don't like being told what to do. You know, which is why if you put up a sign saying, don't go beyond this point. People are going to go mate, asking why. Are please. Yeah. You know, like I've constantly, I remember I was at the cricket one day with a mate and we talked our way into this section of the SCG. So I walked across, I was walking from one area to another area and this lady, and I had a, a, a radio pass, like I was working at 2UE at the time and I had this pass and I said, oh, hi, how are you? you know, from 2 UE, she goes, that's not the pass to get in here. I said, I know. I said, I'm just coming in to fix a bit of gear. And she goes, for who? I said, for 2 UE upstairs. She goes, well, you don't have the right pass. She goes, well, who's he? I said, he's my technician. Mate, we're just like, none, neither, neither of us are technicians. We just had lots of beers at the cricket and I was like, I did want to see someone upstairs. <laughs> so I walked up there and she goes, how long is it going to take? I said, oh, you know what these things are like. <laughs> how long is a piece conference. of string? Like, I don't know how to fix anything, but I go... I said, it should only be 15 minutes. She goes, okay, go up to level seven and it's a second box along. And then when you leave, you walk to the right. So when we left, I was like, I wonder what's to the left. <laughs> like naturally. Yeah. She specifically said, when you leave, you walk to the right. So I was like, I wonder what's left. So when we left this box, I said, let's go left. <laughs> we walk along and then it said police box, like police, police. It must be where they watch the cameras and... And then it said Toyota private viewing room. And then there was a long walk where there was nothing and another Toyota private viewing room. So I just opened the door and it's this massive corporate box, empty. Right? I was like, Ooh. oh my God. So I said, let's just barricade ourselves in here. And then I thought, we need drinks. So then we, we went down to another box and borrowed, you know, said, oh, can we grab a few drinks? Blah, 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 blah. And mate, we spent the whole afternoon in this box. Are you, you sure know. you're not Lebanese? I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. I am part Lebanese. Are you actually? I am part Lebanese. Okay, there you go. Uh, my friends, well, Kieran, Kieran Gilbert and Tim Gilbert. Uh, Timmy, who's been on well, Sky News yeah. and Channel 9. Kieran from Sky News. Many, many years ago, 
um, Kieran said, mate, I think you're Lebanese. And I said, do you think so? He goes, well, mate, you love Lebanese stuff more than any Leb I know. <laughs> so he goes, I'm going to make you part Leb. So he made me part Leb. And then in 2002, I was traveling the world backpacking on my own. And he says to me, um, you going to Lebanon? He goes, you got to, you're part Leb. You've been to the motherland? So I went, okay. So I went to the motherland and had the time of my life. And, and I was looked after like so well. And I didn't want to disturb anyone, but I like, mm. I was, I've got friends who've got family over there and whatever, but I thought, I don't want to be a pain in the ass. Mm. But my mum told this mate of mine, George, that I was there. He called his cousin, George. <laughs> George came to the hotel in Beirut. He goes, Ben, what are your plans? I said, I don't have any plans, George. I'm just chilling out. He goes, I need to know your plans. I said, George, I don't have any plans. I go, well, what's your plan? He goes, my plan is you check out of this hotel and you come with me. I said, let's go. <laughs> and mate, it was just insane. Like I, they wouldn't let me pay for anything the whole time I was there. <laughs> at one stage, we went to watch a movie. It was a Vin Diesel movie, Triple X. And um, I thought, oh, while he's parking the car, I'll duck in and pay for the movie tickets because it's so embarrassing. I'm like, he's not mm. letting me pay for anything. And even when you, like you're at a restaurant, I go, I'll go and sort the bill. I watch him go to the bathroom and I go up and I go, I'll just pay that. And they go, already here. <laughs> and I go, no, 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 he's good. He's good. You know, and they go. And then George walks out of the bathroom and he goes, and he goes, welcome to Lebanon. <laughs> right? So I dealt with all that. But then at the movies, while he was three point turning, I just opened the door. And he goes, don't. And I walked in and I said, two tickets to Triple X. And then he walked in, mate. George had a head of steam up. It's like I, I just, You're mate, it was like hand, yeah. I had just run over his mum and then backed <laughs> over her and then sideswiped his grandma, right? So what I, I had to turn it around. You know, you fight fire with fire. Mm. So he came in, he goes, and he was like, really? I was like, oh, no, I didn't. And I said, George, I said, you need to understand something about my culture, mate. In Australia, we have a thing called the shout. If I don't shout you because of your generosity to me, it's an insult to your family, including your mother. And he goes, the shout. I said, it's called a shout. Okay. I said, you know, I respect your culture. You need to respect mine as well. Otherwise, it's an insult to your mother. And he goes, okay, it's all right then. And we went in. So, and my mate, when I was really tested on my Lebanese heritage, and I'll probably, well, these days you can be whoever you want. You can identify whatever exactly. you want. You can right? identify as Lebanese. Yeah, if you like I can. Me. Right. So. But Kieran Gilbert one day said, look, I'm hosting a Lebanese businessman's forum down at um, Daltone House down on the, the harbour there. You know, 500 Lebanese businessmen and businesswomen and whatever in this big, big room. And Kieran says, I'll get you up for a minute. I said, mate, you don't have to do it. He goes, no, no, no. And he goes, and he introduces me as being Lebanese, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a room full of lebs, right? And I'm like, and he gets up and he goes, just explain your Lebanese heritage. And I was like, oh, and I was like, I just need to be clear here. I've been, you know, welcomed into the Lebanese community. Blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no, 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 you are Leb. He goes, I'll prove it to everyone right here. And I was like, what's he going to do? No prep, right? And he goes, what noise would we make at a Lebanese wedding if we want the couple to kiss? And I'm like, and the whole room does it. And I was like, yes. KG, uh, he just served it up been for welcomed. me. Yeah, you got a yeah, citizenship. Yeah. Uh, good yeah. on you, mate. That, that's, that's pretty hilarious. I mean, and, and you, you are pretty accommodating. I know we had the Once Upon a Time in Lebanon show promote that. We had Joel Vardy come through the other week. Everyone speaks so highly of you. You, you love your ethnic comedy. Yeah, I, I just love the, I don't know. I think I'm, I think I'm just like, I'm a white bread Aussie kid, but I just lean into those things so much. <laughs> and I think so much of it, a lot of it's dominated by mm. food, but also I think I identify with that love of family, mm. love of food, humour. Like I've always loved that stuff. Like Rob Shahady and the boys to hear, um, Joe Avardi. I don't know. I kind of feel like I'm – I owned a Vietnamese pork roll shop at one stage, mm. right? Yeah. And um, because I love Vietnamese food as well and I met this guy, no joke, I, I went to this Vietnamese pork roll shop in Enmore and I was like, mate, you need to open one of these closer to where I was living at the time at Redfern. And he goes, I would if I had someone to go into business with me. I said, I will. <laughs> so I remember Tracy Vo is this great Channel 9 reporter. She's based in Perth now. She's Vietnamese. And I remember telling her, I said, I've opened a Vietnamese pork roll shop. She was like, you? I said, yeah, yeah I'm part Vietnamese. 
So part Vietnamese, part Lebanese, part Greek, part, part Italian. You're a melting pot then. You're I'm a melting, melting pot. pot. Yeah. You know? And, and how good is it? Like, and that's one of the things I love about Australia, getting to know, you know, you meet so mm. many great people, different walks of life. And when they invite you in, I've got to, to give him a mention because Spiro Christopoulos works for me on the radio show. Young Greek boy, surprise, surprise. How you pronounce last name? Christopoulos? Christopoulos. Okay. And um, we go over to his house. Like, I, I engineer things. So I met Spiro's mum and dad, and I said, you should invite the whole team over for a lunch. <laughs> he goes, at my mum and dad's place? I go, yeah. And so the next thing, we're over there. And, mate, <laughs> we're, you know, the food, the drink, the, the experiences, you mm. know. And Spiro, he was a, a talkback caller on my first day filling or taking over the breakfast show. And I was like, boy, again, you know, like ability to communicate, mm. well-mannered. And I said, grab his number. You know, and then he started doing work experience for us. Uh, did his first day for us, I think, after his school formal. He now works for us full time. Won an award last year, best new talent in Australian radio. Wow, awesome! Called a, his first rugby league game. Hosted the continuous call team. Hopefully, he's a Bulldogs fan, Greek Bulldogs fan. What, what? Um, Parramatta. Uh, yeah. he, he does work for you though. Yeah, yeah, he works. He, yeah, he'll yeah. probably be putting in some leave for Mykonos later. <laughs> yeah, he'll be going in the July period. Well, we're trying to find Spiro a girlfriend. Okay, yeah, he's looking for a wife. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants a girlfriend at okay. this stage. But okay. maybe I can send him to kind of learn from you guys a little bit about some of your, you know. I well, mean, I mean, like we are, we're kind of prominent on uh, on social media. We, we can maybe get some tips from Spiro on how to deal with media a little bit better. <laughs> you're, you're 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 putting out your your show, Ben Fordham Live, on TikTok, Instagram. Now, socials yep. is so prominent. A lot of people get their news directly from social media yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. Not many people are even watching the mainstream news anymore. Do you think that's a factor of everything that's happened over the last few years and even just like maybe the media in general having a little bit of a bias, like a media no, left-wing bias? Think it's, I just think it's the same as we order food from Uber Eats because you can. Because it's there. It's convenient. Mm. It's like it's right here. If I want to know, first thing I do in the morning is I – have a quick look at what's going on. I just want to know what's going on straight what's away. Your, what are your choice? Twitter? Straight on well, Twitter? Well, straight on. Well, first news, just just news mm. sites. Have a quick look at Twitter. Have a quick look. I mean, the first thing is mainly news sites mm. and also our work WhatsApp group because if something's happened overnight, someone might have popped it in there. Spiro works for us at night, so if something's happened during the night. For example, when the Queen died, Spiro is saying, I think the Queen's either died or about to die because all the presenters on BBC are now wearing black suits. And like she, it hadn't been announced yet, but it got us ready for it, you know. So, but I think people are more interested in opinion a lot these days than news. Like people tune in to listen to the radio shows because there's opinion on there. Mm -hmm. Because news you can get on your phone, you know. You can't get opinion as readily on, on there. And also the problem is, is that there is an advantage to for traditional media through all of the stuff that goes on online because people have become really skeptical about when they read something on Facebook. You know, like now they go, oh, is that real? I don't mm. know whether it's real. And stuff gets passed around where, so yes, it is competition to traditional media, but it also pushes more people to traditional media in some examples. To verify yeah, to get the Because they want to know whether it's real or not. And I know too, it's like you read something, oh, Richard Wilkins has been arrested. Oh my God, or, or David Koch is, promoting an erectile dysfunction thing. <laughs> wow. No and then, I think that was real. Yeah, yeah and so. then you go, well, I'll get Dickie on, I'll get Koshy on, we'll find out what's really going mm. on. So, you know. But it's, it's, it's great that we can access things so easily. And, mm. you know, you look at what you guys have done. It's like, you know, it's, it's incredible how quickly it's happened for you. But you work hard, right? Well, we, we, we enjoy it. Like, yeah. you, you enjoy your show. Yeah, we but you're, you, you, you can't, if you just did something once every few months, it does, it's not the same. Mm. Volume. You know, you've got to, yeah, it's the volume, it's the content, it's the commitment to going, I want to ask people, I want to get big guests on, and, you know, you have a look at the kind of people that you guys have had on. No, nah, appreciate it, mate. It we'll, helps. We'll, we'll, um, we'll finish up with what we do with every guest. We play a game called fill, fill in the Blanks. Yeah. Okay, so blank is something, and you finish the sentence off. Yeah. Pretty easy. Around your background, you know, but we'll, we'll touch on maybe news, a bit of politics. Your expertise. A bit of sure. sports, your expertise. Just some four quick ones. Blank will be the US president in 2024. Joe Biden. Back to back yeah. for Sleepy Joe. If you were going to, if you were going to now, if you were putting money on it, mm, I think, um, yeah. I'd say that Biden would be the favourite. Um, every time I think Trump's done, 
And it's, I haven't thought that a lot, but a couple of times I thought he's done. And then mm. he'll hold a rally. And then I go, oh, no, hang on a moment. It's like when he did that CNN thing recently where... The town hall. Oh, my Lord. And then I was like, hang on a minute, he's, he's not dead yet. Following. You know, he's mm. got more than a dozen women. There's about 20 of them who've, who've accused him of serious well, sexual assault, right? Fire. And, like, there are some of them... Like, I think this, other, this high-profile case recently where he said, I've never met her. I a actually, civil one. Yeah, I, that, that case, I'm like, you know, I think I agree with him that, that she's crazy. I've mm. watched videos where she talks about rape being Think sexy. sexy yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, I think there might be some in there that aren't true, but 22 women all saying similar things, I think. And we saw him on that Access Hollywood tape where he spoke about mm. grabbing women and you can do whatever you want to them. But every time I think he's out, I don't know. Um, but I just think at the moment you'd say that somehow Biden will probably mm. sneak through, even though... It's scary when you watch Joe, the yeah. condition he's in. I mean, <laughs> Trump's not young either, but Trump runs rings around him he as far as energy. Yeah. But Trump is also just crazy. I think people are sick of either pink and red or blue. Let's just throw a spanner in the worst. Let's Kanye. Like Kanye or yeah, 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 the best thing they there. could do would be to push both of them out of the way and yeah. go, okay, you two have had a turn. You're done. Well, I don't think Joe's going to make it there. I just You look <laughs> no, at him and he's just... I thought that three years ago. Yeah, I know. He's still kicking. You know, and I'm like, yeah. he's still there. <laughs> hey, what about this one? Blank will win state of origin this year. Queensland. Oh, wow. On, As a yep. New South Welshman, then. Yep. Queensland. You're not allowed to cover the game then. <laughs> <laughs> and why, you know why what? Is that? Why is that? I like, I always say it on radio as well. I go, Queensland will win. And the New South Wales audience, which is my audience, mm. they hate it. Right? So I say it partly to, to fire them up. But also, um, and I know that, for example, Andrew Johns hates hearing this. That's he blew up at his brother the other day for I saying know, the same right? thing. Joey hates hearing it. But our cousins moved to Queensland, right? When we were growing up, my cousin Simon and Sally, they, they moved to Queensland. And we'd go to Queensland and they'd mm. come to Sydney and we'd do that kind of thing. And I realised once we hit about 18, 19, I realised, I was like, my Queenslanders are different. <laughs> like at one stage, Simon said to me, he goes, oh, do you want to come to this thing? What we're doing is we do like a, a muck around boxing in, in the backyard. We drink rum and then we just kind of get in the backyard, just mates. And then we just like punch each other out and stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> we don't do that. You know, like, and you know, so I don't know, there's just something about Queensland at State of Origin time that scares me. Mm. And also, I, the worst thing you can be is cocky and say New South Wales. So okay. again, if yeah. I was, not that this is a scientific <laughs> mathematic thing, but if it is, it, I'd say Queensland. One of our producers back there, Ryan, he's from Queensland and... I was having that chat to him before. He's mm. definitely different. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is. It, <laughs> it is. means more to them, I think. It does. Yeah, it does. Maybe because we've got more options here. You know, we've got the... Mm. And you see that with players who come from Queensland and New South Wales. Sometimes they go, oh, we get a bit distracted by all of the stuff that Sydney's got to offer. Very true. Blank is the greatest Australian Prime Minister. John Howard. I think John Howard for mine. Because what I liked about John Howard was... He had this great line that he used to use where he said, love me or hate me, you know where I stand. And we've just been talking before about people losing faith in people mm. and people saying, oh, well, I don't know whether to trust them anymore or whatever. I think the thing that Howard mastered for mine, and look, there'll always be criticisms of a million different policies that he was associated with like anyone else in life. Mm. No one's perfect. GST. That but that, that basic fundamental idea of love me or hate me, you know where I stand, I think when he said that, people went, yeah, that's true. Even if I do hate you, I know what to, ex what to expect from you. And I think that Howard as well, when the world was coming under attack, like around the time of 9-11 and things like that, when he would front the, the camera, Port Arthur, terror attacks or whatever, I think he had this way of capturing the mood of the nation that when he'd have a slight quivering bottom lip, but he'd still show determination and strength. And I just think he had a way of, of doing it well. The Prime Minister who I think probably I admire the most after they've been a Prime Minister is Julia Gillard because I think she has shown people how to behave after you've been Prime Minister, which is don't tell us every five minutes what you think. I haven't heard from her. Don't ever. no, right? Mm. She, and and don't and she got involved in um Beyond Blue. So she's dedicated herself to going kind of helping people, mental health and whatever. But I think she has shown people that once you're out, you're better off being out. If you're constantly sniping and bagging people. Kevin and, Rudd. Yeah, you know, Malcolm oh, Turnbull, Turnbull, Kevin Rudd. Fair, he has a you chance. know, if you're doing that mm. constantly, I think people kind of go, mate, come on, you had mm. your go. And last one for you, Ben. Blank has been your favourite on-air colleague. 
Blank has been my favourite on air colleague. In television, well, let's just give the one answer. Mm. Richard Wilkins. The Hollywood man. Richard Wilkins. And the reason I say that, it's for a range of reasons, but if I called Dickie right now mm. and said, mate, I need you to get into the city now, he'd go, what's happened? I'd go, I need you to come now. He'd go, okay, where are you? And I love that idea of someone who, with Dickie and I, if I say, I'll see you in three Fridays time at midday at that restaurant, I don't have to text him that morning and say, mate, are you still good for today? Yeah, wow. Um, he's there. He was there at five to 12. He's there early, he's there on time, he'll always be there for you. Not that others aren't, but there's something about that. And I think people look at him and go, oh, because he's Hollywood and he's always with movie stars. and uh, always We can't with... discount his work on Smooth 95.3. Yeah, so I'd yeah. Like to say it's Smooth. Mm. Uh, but he's just, he's one of those rock solid guys. Um, and I just love hanging out with him. We, we, I don't know, we've got a bit of a, a thing where we just love hanging out together. And, and I'll often ring him and go, what are you doing? I'll go, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And I swing around to his joint. He loves a gin and tonic. Um, so, and when my kids were born, you know, they do that thing. Um, someone goes, oh, you're going to wet the head, which means that you go to the pub with the boys after mm. the baby's been born. And I was like, I don't know about that. Like what my wife's in hospital, she's just given birth to a human being and I'm going to go to the pub for like 12 hours and wipe myself out. And, you know, like a lot of traditions, I kind of think, oh, that's not really one for me. Mm. But instead, the first time I had a, um, my first kid, Freddie, I just called Dickie and I, I said to Jodie, I might go over to Dickie's and have a G and T. She goes, okay, see ya. And I went over there and I said, man, I'm doing this instead of going to the pub with, you know, 15 people. And so after each kid's been born, I've just done that thing. And he, Dickie's kind of had multiple marriages and kids left, right and centre. He goes, I don't know why you'd be coming to me at a time like this, <laughs> but yeah, he's probably my favourite colleague. Oh, there you go. Do you well, want Dickie in here at some stage? Man, that'd be great if you could put I'll organise that. <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing. I can say, Dickie will do that, and I know he will, and he'll turn up. And if you want some celebrity stories, some romance stories a few as well. few rumours, few gossip, he'd be all over it. Mate, I can give you all of the rumours beforehand, <laughs> then you ask him about it on camera. That's what we need. That's what we need. We'll <laughs> tee that up for sure. Mate, no, Ben, really appreciate your Mate, time. I loved it. You're, Thanks, you're, boys. You're a legend, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the phone lines open. I might call into the AM radio, <laughs> give my opinion here and there, but no, appreciate your time. Good on you, boys. Legend, Thanks so much, lads.